Shadow Time. Welcome back to the Enjoy the Walk podcast. Uh, sticking with the theme, Dante, of uh, the golf associations this week. Uh, it's been a fun one, to say the least, to uh, kind of dive in to see the inner workings of uh, how the junior game has been uh, approached and, and kind of built on the AJGA a little bit this week. And, uh, you know, something that's close to you and myself, you know, you in the New Jersey area and, and me down in Maryland um, is the State Run Golf Association. You know, we've uh, had our fair share of playing in our perspective uh, state events, whether it's the AM, the Open, and, um, you know, with me just turning 25, pumped to hopefully see the mid-AM come come around and, and be scheduled this year. So uh, excited to bring on the show, you know, a, um, a director in the Maryland State Golf Association, you know, my neck of the woods. And uh, he's He's been in the in the realm of golf organizations for well over a decade now and uh, excited to bring Kelly Newland on and, and just talk golf. So, Kelly, how's everything going, man? Yeah, th thanks for having me. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to uh, to talk to me this evening. Things are going good. I think I'm, you know, I think I'm doing what everyone's doing, kind of waiting at home for golf courses to open back up. Uh, I get that question more than, than anything over the last three or four weeks from people is, you know, when are we going to get back on a golf course? And uh, I feel like I don't really know more than, than anyone else does, but I sure hope I sure hope that day soon. Yeah, I can only imagine as being uh, in the State Golf Association, you know, a lot of people look to you as the, the almost, you know, speaking head of golf uh, during during the times when it's shut down. So um, it's I know from our perspective, it's it's tough to not know. But uh, we're, we're everyone's kind of hanging on the, the cliff of uh, of what the governors have to say at this point. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, they got, they got some tough, uh, tough jobs to do for sure. Um, yeah, more responsibility than I know, uh, I'd like to take on during, during these times for sure. Yeah, we, but. we got to spend more time on the, on the sky tracks and the opti shots and the, and the, you know, the in-home <laughs> golf systems than, than I think we'd, more of us would ever expect it. There you go. That's a great way to pass the time. You have to some way, but back into golf, you know, back into f just how we got here, how you got to Maryland State Golf Association. Um, take us through, you know, where you first got introduced to the tournament director side of golf. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I grew up in Kentucky. Um, my dad and my brother introduced me to the game around 13 or 14. So I got started a little later than, than some. Um, as far as tournaments, I, I enrolled at the Eastern Kentucky University in the PGA golf management program to get my PGA membership. I was actually the first class, so we were the, there, there was 20 of us, and we were the first inaugural class of EKU's golf management program, and they needed a tournament director. They said, okay, guys, we've got to play. And one of the criteria is you've got to pass your playing ability test um, to get your PGA membership. So we had to play in a couple events a week, and they needed someone to, to run those tournaments. So I raised my hand and signed up. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> but that's how I got started, was I ran, I ran all the tournaments for the university for our program. And then that led to, to some just great internships. So one of the things that you have to do in the PGA is you have to complete four internships to get your membership. Um, so I was already, you know, I was already involved with tournament operations at the university level. And then I was able to go in and, and work uh, for the Callaway PGA Junior Series. That was my first internship. Um, and then from there, you know, we traveled the country. One week we'd be in Boston, uh, Massachusetts running a junior tournament. And then two weeks later, we'd be in Hawaii running a junior tournament. So I got to travel the country, got to see a lot of great golf courses, um, and really, you know, developed a passion for the game, but more importantly, developed a passion for tournament operations by, you know, by completing those internships. Now, now talk us through, you know, you, you obviously <coughs> got to travel the country, like you said, through the PGA Junior Series. How, I guess, uh, how long ago was that? Like, what time span was that? And and how did you guys, I guess, you know, via our previous interview, see yourselves maybe competing or even not just competing, but working alongside the likes of like the a the AJGA? Yeah, so those those internships have been a little while ago. That was like 2007, 2008. Um, and that was kind of like the, uh, you know, the pinnacle of junior golf. The best players played in those events. We had, we had Lexi Thompson. We had Jordan Spieth. Um, you know, back in those days before anybody knew who they were. Um, a quick story about Lexi. We had the uh, PGA Junior Championship uh, in Ohio at the end of the summer, and no one knew who she was. She was this little 13-year-old girl. I was, I was on the starting tee, helping get the players started. Nobody knew who she was. She, she stood up on the first tee, drove the first green. It was probably 290 yards. 
you know, we're standing around with our jaws on the ground. And she didn't act like it was, you know, no big deal, put her club back in the bag and walked off and went on to win the, win the event. Um, so there's been some really great players that played through that. And as, as far as, as far as the ally, the, the golf association level, I didn't really get involved with the golf association um, until after I graduated. So I started working for um, uh, Kentucky golf association, the Kentucky PGA section, which they work under the same building. Uh, it's golf house, Kentucky. So that's where I really got involved with golf associations. Um, before that, it was just individual tours. Gotcha. It's funny, it, you, the way you mentioned Lexi's story there. Um, it's funny when these kids grow up and, you know, they get now, she has the lore of being this long ball hitter. And people will think are like, oh, well, she must have just, you know, worked out hard and, and gotten to that a little later in life. And it's like, it's cool to see, like, she was 13 and still bombing the ball. Oh, she was bombing the ball. And, you know, it was a skinny, scrawny little thing. Nobody thought she could put it out there. Um, but it was, it was a playing firm and fast, but still, I mean, to drive the first hole, you know, all the other players are 30, 40 yards back. She's, she's got to put on the first hole. Yeah. That, that's awesome. And it's cool to see just, you know, kids like that have always been playing. And I think, you know, you mentioned you started at 13 and um, there, there's, there's some kids out there that end up, you know, starting later in life and seeing success at the professional level. But it seems nowadays, even more than not, you know, you have to start at, you know, eight, nine, 10 even to, to really make a, a strong push at playing professionally, at least by like your, your lower to mid twenties. Oh, definitely. Yeah. You got to get started early for sure now to, um, to really have that advantage, you know, to have those 10,000 hours of practice under your belt before you can play D one, you know, college, <laughs> that's what they tell you now is that you've got to have that set in, set number of hours of practice under your belt. Yeah, no, I, that 10, 000, that 10,000 hour theory runs true. I think, you know, more than people give it credit for is, you know, yeah. it's just no matter, you can't cut it one, one way or the other of just putting in the time and putting in the reps uh, to, to see success, especially within the game of golf. Now you started in Kentucky. Um, take us through kind of what that position was like. You graduated from Eastern Kentucky University. Um, did you, did you see the tournament director side of things kind of right off the bat? Um, and, and how did tournaments, you know, see themselves being run within the Kentucky, Kentucky section of the PGA? Yeah, so I actually, right out of school, I started uh, in St. Louis. I uh, worked for like eight months as the junior director for the PGA section. So I ran that junior tour. And then the junior position in Kentucky opened up, and I had to, I had to jump on it because it was closer to home. It made more sense. Sure. So I came back to Louisville, and I was, I was in Kentucky for around three years, maybe three and a half years. Um, and I got to run the uh, junior tour and the senior tour. So it was really interesting. Um, I got both, you know, both sides <laughs> of the bracket there, so to speak. Um, I used to always tell the seniors that I was happy to see them because they didn't bring their parents out to the course. Right? <laughs> because the juniors, I mean, and the junior, junior golf is so much fun, but it is, it's a, you know, you have to put a lot of work in a lot of hours and it's demanding. You know, you got a lot of parents that, to please when you're, when you're on, some, on, your, on the summer circuit. Um, but yeah, that's really where I got started and we travel the whole state. So from the east side to the west side of Kentucky, maybe a seven, eight hour drive. You know, we'd be in Paducah one day and then two days later, we'd be on the eastern side of Kentucky running. Events. So I'd have five or six interns. We'd pack up and the whole summer you're on the road running junior tournaments. Um, so that's really where I got started. That's pretty neat. And, you know, um, Dante, I don't know if you know this as well as I do, just because you played the cross kind of growing up through uh, high school and stuff. But uh, I played in the Philadelphia series of like the junior PGA uh, a lot when I was a kid. And um, even with just, you know, their small nucleus of what they considered Philadelphia, you know, they played like the greater Philadelphia area. I remember <laughs> – God bless my parents. Like you said, they're, they, they're pretty much usually at every event. And if it wasn't a parent, it was a grandparent getting me to events or, you know, the whole gamut of aunts and uncles always chipped in too. It was kind of whoever was available. And I mean, I remember just in the greater Philadelphia junior PGA of going to Delaware for tournaments, you know, they had tournaments near the shore. Um, they had tournaments in kind of like the North Eastern part of Pennsylvania. And it's like, you know, for greater, just in the greater Philadelphia area, they had so many kind of wide ranged events. Like I can't imagine, like you said, <laughs> going from eight hours from all the side West to the East of Kentucky, um, how busy and just kind of demanding that summer schedule had to be. Yeah, it was, it, it was grueling. It was a lot of fun. Um, like you say, parents, it's almost a full-time job for the summer, you know, for the summer parents, they're on the road the whole summer as well, taking their kids everywhere. 
Um, you know, it also gave me an ability to really cut my teeth on the rules of golf. Because if you want to, if you want to learn about the rules, the best place to go is a junior tournament. You know, especially the young kids. You know, because they're going to break. You know, <laughs> throughout the round. Um, whereas if you showed up at the Maryland Amateur, you may only see one or two good rulings the whole week. You know, but if you go in, into a junior tournament, you get to see all these different uh, rule situations. You have to learn. You have to learn that way, and that's the best way to learn. I guess I never really thought of that, and and kind of just looking back on it, you know, j- junior golf is so. Uh, so funny in that way because sometimes the kids you know are just so innocent they have no clue um, yeah. it, it's more or less how they've you know maybe been taught the game from their their sandbagging parents or you know and not to throw the parents under the bus but sometimes the kids just don't know and um, that's interesting man what what would you say the one one or two rules that kind of maybe constantly come up within junior golf that you really don't see on the amateur level you know the one that came up the most and you may not see it as much anymore but the people for whatever reason feel like they have um, relief for line of sight from a water hazard or penalty area as we call it now the line of flight you know I went in I went in like this I hope I hit a slice into the, the, the hazard so this is where I take my relief and that's not in the book um, you know you the way you take relief as you guys know is you go back on the line from where you crossed but they think they'd have to take relief that way uh, you know it's funny because even in, you know I study this stuff daily I, I take a, a USGA course every year and have to pass a test. And there's still certain things that I have ingrained in, in from playing with my brother um, that I think are true that aren't true, right? That you, know, you can't have the, um, the flagstick attended if you're off the green, that kind of thing. Just, you know, goofy things. The way you played growing up is how you learn the rules. Yeah. So you have to unlearn some of those things. Um, but I think the hazard rulings are definitely the ones that the penalty area now, the new word is penalty area. I can't say hazard. I, I get caught in that all the time like, yeah it's in the hazard and they're like mm, i don't know about that it's a little different <laughs> and that's the crazy thing and, and and things as we look forward not only in like the last year or so but even moving forward there's always going to be you know the the rna and the usga constantly are tweaking things and you know it's, the hazard thing i mean I played the golf now for close to 20 years and that's just how it was. And, and then you, you go and say, well, that's, it's not that anymore. It's just not in your vocabulary. That's tough yeah. to get out of. Yeah, absolutely. The hardest one for me, and we mess it up all the time is um, casual water. That's it's temporary water. Right. Oh, really? I just <laughs> like, learned something. Yeah, just so learned that temp- today. Temporary water. So if you, wow. I'll give a, I'll give a rule seminar in front of a hundred people. And I, I usually mess that one up and somebody will you know, yell at you. It's temporary water. <laughs> it's funny. And I mean, you look at a case in point right now, you know, we're struggling with, with just the little nuances. And then, you know, you look at the junior golf and, and it's kind of just realizing that, man, you know, there are so many nuances within the, the rule book of the game that juniors can't possibly comprehend it all, let alone relearn it the minute they get into tournament golf. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, and we'd say this in our, our seminar. So I think the best place to learn is on the golf course. You know, it's really hard to book. It's really hard to learn opening up a book or even going through a, a seminar, you need to learn. The best way to learn is on the golf course. Yeah. Uh, Hunter, I agree with that 100% yeah. because my competitive, uh, I guess, experience is a lot um, less than, say, like Dalton's. I mean, I'm only like kind of like five years into the competitive aspect of it, just doing, you know, mid-am stuff or whatever, even just like local uh, member stuff and just even like the weekend games that we play. Uh, the rules – I learned best by just playing. I mean, I've tried taking the rule book out, but man, at that, when I pulled that, that just a lot of that stuff went over my head because half the times it's like, well, here's this scenario, but here's like five other scenarios that relate to that rule, (laughs) which could also happen. And I just said, you know what, for me being visual and kind of more hands-on, I said, I just, just got to go out and just play. And if I'm, you know, if I mess up on a rule, someone tells me and then, I learn from it and we yeah. move on and hopefully next time I don't do it again. Yeah. That's the best way. Breaking rules will help you learn them. That's the best way. <laughs> it's, it's unfortunate, but it's so true. I mean, especially with the game of golf, it's just crazy. There's some things you just have to learn and say, Oh, well, I just did that. And then someone's like, yeah, yeah, it's not, that's, you can't do that. And then <laughs> it, it's it, by doing that, like you said, you just, you get yourself in situations that you just learn, you have to learn. Um, and it's best learned on the course. So now take us through, you, you were with Kentucky organizations for a while, um, and then you came to Maryland. So, so what brought you to Maryland and the position that you currently hold now? Yeah. So as you 
all that time was with junior golf and I really enjoyed it, but there comes a time where you're like, you know, I've got to make a change and get, you know, move up the ranks, so to speak, and, and put junior golf behind me. And this was an opportunity. I mean, the job that opened up in Maryland to be in charge of all the men's amateur championships for the state, you know, it was really, um, uh, you know, a bump in, in, in terms of my career. Um, so I was excited about it. I've, I've really enjoyed it the last five years. You know, I love Kentucky. I love Kentucky basketball. There's a lot of things about Kentucky. But uh, Maryland's got so many great golf courses. You know, I mean, like I was telling you, that eight-hour drive, we may have four, five, six high-level, top-level golf courses that compare to the 30, 40, 50 that you'll find between here and the Washington Beltway. So there's just, you know, so, such more of a concentrated area of great golf. Um, so that was the big reason that I, that I made the switch back in to come to Maryland when it opened up. Yeah, it's really crazy. Like you just stated, how how dense of a of a course population that Maryland has. Because you know, I I grew up in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, which is really just across the Mason Dixon line, fifteen twenty minutes, um, and and would come into Maryland a lot to play golf around like the Emmitsburg area. The, even you get in the Frederick area a little bit is where I would play a good bit. And and just in that area, you know, I mean there's a course that I grew up playing Worthington Manor that holds a lot of your guys' championships, you know, year in and year out. And if it's not you guys, it's with the USGA for U S open qualifiers too. And, um, and that's not even getting into, I mean, it's kind of the wet Washington Metro area, but uh, yeah. much closer to DC than it is to, to Baltimore. But um, you know, let, let's touch on that for a little bit. How, um, how do you guys really pick the courses? I mean, obviously there's courses that have a lot of history behind them. Um, like Worthington Manor that just year in and year out is a great venue for you guys. But, you know, when you see new events pop up, what is the selection process like for you guys to, to really go about choosing a course? Yeah. Worthington's a great example. Um, just popularity when you can host, host anything out there and it'll, it'll fill up when people yeah. are playing out there. Um, look at our schedule. We try to be sensitive to the fact that, you know, if let's take a junior amateur, for instance, if we hosted that in the Baltimore corridor last year, this year we want to try to post that in the D.C. corridor. So we alternate Baltimore and D.C. Um, and we try to hold, hold about half of the championships in each region and then alternate them. Um, so that's one key to that. You know, the other key is that we've got the, we've got the playbook, so to speak, the Excel matrix of where we've hosted every championship over the last, you know, 30, 40 years. Um, so we wouldn't want to take the junior amateur back to the same place two years later. So we try to spread that out. Um, and then, you know, it really comes down to relationships as far as scheduling um, goes. A lot of times, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time the last five years, you know, developing the rela relationships with the head pros. Um, and it's easier for me as a PGA professional. I see these guys at my PGA meetings and, you know, I'm a member of the association. So we have a lot of interactions. Um, and a lot of times the PGA pro is the one that's making the decision on whether the course is going to host the tournament or not. Mm. So, you know, you have, you know, let's say a couple dozen of those that you know you can work with. Um, so that helps out for sure. Um, so a lot of a lot of that plays into it, and we try to we try to find places that are going to be popular participation wise. Um, as far as new events, and I know you guys wanted to talk about new events, we have so many championships that have such a rich, rich history. You know, our uh, Maryland Amateur, Maryland Open. This is the 99th um, hosting of that this year. Yeah. Um, so we're, so we're celebrating our 100 year anniversary for the association next year in our 100th Maryland Amateur, Maryland Open, the Women's Am. The women's AM has been around for 99 years. Uh, even the father's son has been around since 1936. I mean, it's just crazy. Somebody it's incredible. It just really shows you too, you know, so many people talk about, you know, Georgia having such a, a kind of history of golf and old golf and, and, you know, out into the kind of Midwestern states having old golf and not, I don't know why, but Maryland usually doesn't, hit that conversation for some reason, but then you start to look at how long the association has been around and, and you you start to realize, dang, Maryland's right there in that conversation with having some of the like longest standing golf championships. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the history, uh, some of the championships are really, they're really interesting to go back and see how many, you know, how many amateurs, uh, Marty West has won. How many, you know, how many opens of, you know, you go back and you see some of the great players, Fred Funk back in the eighties, won a couple of different Maryland opens. So there's, there's just a lot of history to a lot of. Um, 
you know, and it's funny because I've followed the game of golf for a very long time. And, and when I moved down here, it was the first time I realized that Fred Funk had had such a career in Maryland. I, I just, I don't know if it just maybe blew right over my head or I just didn't realize, but that's kind of where he got his start in playing a lot of good competitive golf was in the Maryland area. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's cool too, because I kind of got a firsthand view of how the AM and the Open was run um, in 2018. Um, little known fact, I think you became my best friend there for about, you know, a good week or two before the Open. I got the call as, as an alternate to come play and, and was just, you know, elated to, to be able to play in, a, in an Open because uh, I had actually known the course. Fountainhead was uh, a, a course that had, you know, been on my radar for a while. I was like, man, if there's, a, if there's ever a tournament there, I want to I want to play in it because it's one of those old style courses that has a lot of history on it from, you know, just being played a lot and uh, yeah. was, was pumped to be able to play in that event. And, you know, it's one of those old school tree line courses that just absolutely tests you when you get to the green. And, um, had way, way too many three putts than I'd like to admit out there that week. But, uh, you know, from top to bottom, it was, it was one of those courses that just, you guys ran an epic event at. Yeah, that was a fun, it was a fun week. I mean, I, I can't remember exactly what the course tipped out to, but I think it was like 6,400. Yeah. You know, some it was well 60, under 65. I know that. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of the guys that have never played there are like, Oh, we're going to tear this place up. It's like, okay, good luck. You know, <laughs> see how small those greens are. And then the conditions we had, you know, it really firmed up, and got fast. And, uh, you know, it's funny I, you, when you sent that outline and you said, you know, you, you enjoy being called and letting, letting them go. That's like the, my favorite week. Right? <laughs> when I set the field for the open, you know, we may have odd numbers or we may have two or three people that pull out. And then I get to go to the list of the alternates that miss by one stroke and make those phone calls. And so that's like, you know, that's like the best phone call you can make is to make someone's day and call them up and be like, hey, you want to play in the open? Yeah. Playing the amateur. And those are one um, of the, those are one of the things as like a competitor, as just someone who's been around the game a while, you, you never expect that call. Like when you're listed as an amateur, you pretty much just write it off, especially yeah. in the state events. Cause a lot of the times, you know, guys just typically play and in and, and, and really good venue places too. They like to make an account to play. And um, it's just not a call you expect ever getting. And, and, you know, when, when you do get it, you're just, you're, you're more than elated. Cause you're like, all right, like I get to play. And let, yeah. Let's go. Um, and, you know, the AM also that year, I was blessed to play two of like the area, Maryland's just premier courses. The AM that year was at Baltimore Country Club. Um, and I want to talk about how, you know, you guys have structured your AM competition because I think it's a little different than other states, but I like the way it's, you know, structured. Um, it's 18 holes, correct me if I'm wrong, 18 holes of stroke play followed yeah. by match play. Um, now, has that always been that way since you've been the director or did that ever change since you took kind of direction of the tournament? No, it's always been that way. Um, the only thing that may have changed is that we host more, but we, we added an extra qualifier. So those four qualifiers we run in May, um, but no, that, that setup has always been the case. So you've got 18 holes of stroke play qualifying down to the 31 individuals for match play plus last year's champion. So you got 32 mm-hmm. going to match play. Um, so Friday, Saturday, Sunday is, is match play. And it's, you know, I shouldn't say that I have a favorite event, but I do. And that the Maryland Amateur is by far my favorite event. I mean, it's so much fun to watch those guys compete, um, in that, in, in the match play format. I always say when you, when you bring that level of competitor together and you don't see match play much anymore, I feel like there's so many stroke play events out there just at the state level. Um, and you really only get to see match play at kind of, you know, your other am events when it when you take into the usam and, and different stuff like that then you start to see the the kind of pool come in come together bracket style match play but when you get competitors and guys that can go four or five six under at any given point you know and, and they get beside another guy that can do the same you you get some great battles down the stretch of guys just firing birdies back to back yeah. to back it's incredible i don't i don't know if it's that you know they're, they're not worried about the scorecard so they're not thinking about what they're they're doing when they get out there but i mean you've, we've had guys have eight or nine birdies in a round you know and win one up <laughs> well, you had nine birdies eight birdies um so the match plays and the match plays a lot of fun to set up you know that format for, as far as a course setup perspective that's a lot of fun too yeah how do you guys go about that that differs from your stroke play you know what does the match play setup look like compared to a stroke play event so the big difference with match play and, and stroke plays we don't have to worry about pace of play as much and daylight um 
so hole locations, you know, I give you a, an example. We had, a, we had the Maryland Amateur at El, uh, Elkridge a few years ago. I don't know if you guys have played there, but there's a downhill par three, number 13. Um, it's got a Biarritz hole, you know, one of those huge trenches in the green. Um, so one round of match play, we've got the tee pushed all the way up with a really tucked hole location on the front left corner. It's probably a pitching wedge or a nine iron for most of these guys. And then the next time they come around, we're on the back tee on the very back of the green, and it's probably a 70-yard green. Back, you know, back of the green, back tee box, it's probably a three-wood. <laughs> or three is a nine iron to a three-wood. Um, you know, and they don't know. They don't know that that's changing. Um, but it, that's what's – that's, you know, part of the thing that's so enjoyable when you're setting things up like that. And you can pick hollow locations that you probably wouldn't pick in stroke play, right? Because you're going to – like, again, you're worried about pace of play. Um, so you may, put, you may put some hollow locations out there that you may not – pick and stroke play. Also, you're going to want to look at, you know, putting some holes, some hole locations out there that encourage birdies. You know, you want guys to win holes with birdies, um, not necessarily pars or bogeys. Uh, that doesn't mean you'd set every hole up easy, but you want to think your way around and set up six or seven opportunities for them to really, you know, make some noise on the golf course. So that's when that, you know, that buzz starts when you've got all those matches out there. Um, that's what I, that's what I love about match play too. And it's a shame that you don't see it more often on the pro side of it. And even like, I mean, like we got amateur s stuff as well, but it, it gives that like one person who just has that just one blow up hole. If it's stroke play, they're mostly likely, you know what I'm Xing. I'm, you know, telling my playing competitors, Hey, I'm out. I don't really feel like going through this struggle. I'm just going to call it a day, you know, and end up just, you know, X and out for the for the remaining of the tournament and then basically that money that you just spent just is right out the window with match play though you know you, you just you say you know what you win this hole i'll i still have a shot to come back and actually and absolutely like compete and i think that's what's great about it and that's i, I like to, i would like to see more of it so it's cool like you're saying that you like check it out but i mean you get you get one shot i mean you blow up on one hole it's like all right no big deal i can move yeah. on and, and try and come back Right. Stroke play, it's it's game over. Especially <laughs> like you're saying, you got guys going eight eight under it with an eight holes. I mean, that's you go you shoot like a ten on a hole. Well, adios. Right, and that'd be hard to recover from. But a match mm -hmm. play, you just move on to the next. Yeah, I can't yeah. tell you how many times you know you throw like a triple in there, and you say, "Man, that's a round ruiner." And then yeah. you know you look at match play, and you know not saying like I, I ever want to make a triple in match play either. But if you do make it, like you said, Dante, it's like, all right, pick up on the next hole, whatever. Most most times, I'm probably not even finishing out a, a seven or an eight. You know, guy makes par, and I'm just on to the next hole anyway. And <laughs> it is, yeah. you don't have to have that kind of like demoralizing mental state in in match play as much as you do as you see it in stroke play. But I, I love the fact that you're able to set up a course a little different because, I mean, that's the number one thing I think we've talked about, Dante, a lot too, is like you, you gave the example of, of a par of three that at one point plays at a pitching wedge or a nine iron and in the same, same round, same course, you know, nothing weather change or anything like that was all of a sudden a three wood just by a pin change and a tee change. Um, yeah. I think that's the number one thing too we talk about with um, with the big distance debate that everyone always tries to throw out there is like oh well you know we need to do this or do that with equipment and it's like well if you just set up the course maybe a little tougher it, it it's like we just said with Fountainhead planes maybe 64 and some change um, yeah it, it it was a bear for the entire week and now granted not a lot of places have fast firm undulated greens like Fountainhead does but um, there's a lot to be said about course setup when you go into controlling the outcome of a tournament. Yeah, and I think you you know you, you want to make the player think, right? So um, you got those courses that are seventy four hundred yards, and it's just okay. You, there's nothing to think about. I'm going to hit driver on every par four and every par five. You know, when we set up tournaments, we we want to make sure that we're making you think. You get to the tee, and you're like, man, should I hit three wood here, <laughs> driver? I don't want you to go through a whole round and not have to use your brain, you know, at some point throughout the round. Um, and I think that was what was great about Fountainhead that you know you had you had to think about every one of those tee shots and yeah. those approach shots. I think if I'm remembering correctly, the third hole out at Fountainhead, uh, huge dog leg left of a par five uh, tee shot. You know, it was one of those perfect examples. You could take it right down the fairway with about maybe 
a soft hybrid for some guys, long iron, iron for others, or you could cut the corner, which is completely blind, huge risk reward. If you didn't hit cut the corner, you were blocked out way left and had to either punch out or punch up. And you know, you yeah. were, you were, it was a huge risk reward shot. And there's, there's a lot of times that's, that's make or break for, you know, guys winning or, or finishing outside the top 10 is when they make that decision. And I love that there's, uh, you know, holes like that on tournament courses, because that, like you said, we need to be able to use our brains and, and have that decision-making process because without it, it's just a mundane round of guys just, like you said, pulling out driver every time, and then it becomes a pitch and putt. You know? Yeah. Uh, that's where a lot of those old school courses, I, I still love uh, when tournaments are back at, at short, but methodical courses like that. It really, I think, begins to separate, you know, some really good players. Yeah, I agree. hundred percent. Aside from the tournament setup side of things, um, we mentioned you, you mentioned it a little earlier uh, with like the Fred Funks and, and the guys like that, you know, probably most recently Denny McCarthy coming through Maryland and, and really, you know, getting on tour um, with the history of the MSGA and just the good players that have come through it, you know, um, in your time with Maryland State Golf Association, has there been any other really big names to come through the association? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned uh, Denny, which was, you know, top of my list. I think he's 57th on the PG, on the money list right now on the PGA Tour. He actually won the first uh, Maryland Open I ran back in 2015 at uh, Columbia. So <laughs> I got to see Denny play my first year, which was, you know, which was fun. Um, there's been a lot of guys that have, you know, dipped their toe in the water and then come back and got their amateur status back. Um, so there's been several of those guys. I think a couple of guys that are still out there trying to, to make it and, and doing well – Brad Miller is a great example. Um, Brad won the Maryland Open, uh, I think it was 2017, uh, at Woodholm. He's won, he won the, am, the junior amateur growing up. And uh, he's got status on the Corn uh, Ferry Tour now. Um, he's done really well. Ryan Cole, who ended up winning the, the Open that you played in, mm -hmm. he's still out there. And, uh, you know, he was a James Madison graduate. Um, those are the two that come to mind when I think about guys that are still out there playing professionally. And then there's been several guys that have done a tremendous job and they've come back and got their amateur status back. I think about Billy Peel. You know, <laughs> Bill had an incredible uh, year last year. He blew our player of the year uh, point system out of the water. He won the Maryland amateur. He won the four ball. He came really close to winning the mid-am. Um, you know, and he, he just played he just played great all year, all year long. So there's, there's a ton of guys like that. Ty Harriet, you know, who came back and he's got his amateur status back. Um, as you can see, I wrote a couple of these down because I'll forget names. Yeah, hey, I'm the same way. You know, names are tough, and and when when you're running an organization like that, there's there's so many applicants and names that I'm sure that some get lost in the water. But uh, I'm glad you mentioned Ty because I actually had the pleasure of playing with him at Fountainhead uh, in that Open, and uh, at the time he was, I believe, up in Canada. Uh, traveling yeah. back and forth and uh, we step on the first tee and him and his caddy are kind of just like walking up really lackadaisical you know I mean it ended up just I realized that's just his demeanor you know very laid back very awesome cool guy to talk to and and uh, he was like just putting barely putting his shoes on and, uh, and you know we get to talking all, off the first tee down the first fairway he's like, yeah I just rolled in from Canada about half an hour ago like his him and his caddy made the drive right after uh, I think qualifying round or something like that for the, the Canadian tour up there so, uh, I mean, it's cool to see, too, you know, guys like that that are giving it a go, man, uh, just absolute grinders. And, um, you know, he was a hell of a ball striker, played, played some pretty good rounds that week. And uh, it was just cool to see, you know, I mean, guys in our local area are, are making something of, you know, the success they're having just within the state association as well. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's, it's, it's fun to get to watch them play, you know. Yeah. A different sound they make off the court than a lot of guys and – their, their short game is a thing that, that I love to watch the most. Yeah, that was a, that was just something I think Dante and I always talk about when we when we talk about guys that you know either we know or just that are on tour. Man, it's uh, short short game pays dividends to to a lot of these guys that when and it, it is just a different sound they make off the tee as well. Yeah. So now you know. We, we wouldn't we wouldn't be doing our listenership base a, a favor I feel like unless we asked uh, a little bit about the mid handicap tournaments you know uh, Dante and, and and myself kind of talked on air and off air about you know the need for maybe more um, mid to high handicappers and then when we when we say high handicap I get I think we're referring to like ten to twelve or even in that range um, 
is, is there any possibility of, of a state organization like you guys running more mid to high level handicap events like that? Or, or is that still kind of reserved for, you know, your private run golf tournament associations? No, I, th I think it's a great idea. And I think, uh, you know, our tournament and competitions committee has, has had talks over the last couple of years um, about what we could do. You know, we, we do those one day events that are open to players of all abilities, you know, handicap, but, and we do give prizes out, but it's more casual, you know, but if you want to play in a tournament style and, you know, have that kind of pressure and be, um, and you're a mid-level player or a higher handicap player, you can play in our one day events. We do six or seven of those a year. Um, so I think that's an outlet for them, but I think, uh, you know, mid to high level, a mid handicap championship uh, is a great idea. I think it really is. I think if we could figure out a way, you know, when you look at the schedule, you look at the MSGA schedule, you also have to look at the, the Washington Metropolitan schedule and the Mid-Atlantic Golf Association schedule. you got to look at what the PGA section is doing. And, you know, there's only so many dates, you know, so many days on the calendar or in our golf season, really. Um, so you got to be mindful of that. But I, I think it's a great idea. Um, I really do. I'd like to see that happen. Yeah, we always talk about too, and you mentioned it perfectly. I think it's it's tough to add new events to an already packed schedule, um, but I think just from you know Dante seeing kind of just getting into the game within the last couple of years, um, there there's a huge uh, I think you know kind of nucleus of, of people around that area, whether it's guys that are working 40 plus hours a week and, you know, just don't have the time to really get to a single digit level um, or, or, you know, just are hanging out at that, you know, seven to 12 range. I think there's a big nucleus and, and would be really cool to see an event added like that. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I say it a lot. Uh, I'm sitting like kind of like at a five, but I've done so like I'm part of GAP, you know, Golf Association of Philadelphia area even though I'm in Jersey, I mean, they're, they're spread all the way up at the Scranton down the even maybe I think Delaware as well, but you know, they have a lot of their mid AM stuff and whatnot. And, you know, last year was my, my first year. I was like, let me give it a test. Cause obviously, you know, you got to play with the, with the best in order to get better. Uh, but I mean, some of those guys are just, they're just unreal. I mean, we are, we got our, like our plus handicaps in our, our course just getting, smoked by some of these players and it's like yeah. it'd be cool and i said like like i get it it's probably tough on a logistics standpoint and even possibly on a partition standpoint because a lot of you i mean you i'm not knocking anybody but those seven to twelves maybe just want to go out and have some fun and just play their local member stuff but i mean i feel like there's a lot of there's still a handful of people that want to get into that competitive aspect of it but they're kind of yeah. just a little timid Oh, and jumping in with, you know, like, you know, going full throttle with the big boys. And it, it, it would be cool to see. Um, I know it's difficult. I just, that's just, that's something that kind of comes up on my radar. And I always bring it up to Dalton a lot. So it's good to see that, you know, that's kind of like in, in your radar and like something that you guys would possibly like to see down the road. Obviously logistics is probably one of the bigger issues and then probably comes participation. But yeah, that, that's kind of, that's, that's cool to see. And that's something that's like always on kind of on my like radar because I'm always trying to find, I was like, let me kind of like, Hey, is there any way I can ease into it? And you just couldn't really find anything. Yeah. But that's, that's cool to say. I really like that. I mean, and the, you know, the four ball ideas that you guys are talking about, you know, a lot of those one day events um, that we do are four ball related so that the guys that have, you know, mm -hmm. higher of a handicap and aren't comfortable playing in a tournament format, they can bring a partner with them and play some four ball um, yeah I, I love seeing that format kind of you know make make its headway into a, you, you know obviously the usga having it now and, and all, all the state events uh state associations jumping on board uh it's a cool you know format to see um and i'd like love to see more of it i think it just it it, it encourages people to get into events that like you said would dante would not have maybe thought about yeah. it or were just on that precipice of you know easing their you know getting their feet wet in tournament golf but not really entirely confident in their own game um i always feel like you know when you can strap on a buddy's back and and, and ride him you know sometimes it, it encourages you to get into that atmosphere and it can be the deciding factor i think in, in people actually you know biting the bullet not biting the bullet but you know taking charge of their own individual entries down the road of, of getting them into events down you know further down the line and you like you'll you'll learn the rules too i mean everything's straight up so, I mean, if you mess up and cause I know a lot of, you know, weekend member 
uh, games are a little bit lenient with certain rules, depending on conditions and just who they're playing with. But once yeah. you sign up for one of those, you're it's it's by the book. So it's a, it's a good opportunity to also uh, see where your game's at, see where you can take it, and also just learn the rules. Um, I know some of that for me as well has been a good learning experience at the same time of just being able to, you know, just learn new rules or just learn the rules that I didn't know. Yeah. I mean, we said it earlier, the the best way to, to truly understand how to play tournament golf is just to go play it and to, to, to learn as you're, in, as you're in the tournament. So, uh, you know, mistakes will be made. I, I know we can all say our fair share of uh, tournament <laughs> golf mistakes have been made and, and you know what you learn from it and it sticks with you for some reason, those in tournament <laughs> mistakes stick with you. And, and you, the minute you tee up next t- next round, it's uh, I, I know if, I mean, for me, I, I, one time it took one time I accidentally had an extra club in the bag carry yeah. it for about eight holes you best believe me every time before I'm stepping onto the tee I mean it's just <laughs> it's an it's a habitual thing now I'm counting every club uh, yeah. people laugh at me they're like really you're counting your clubs I'm like hey you just you can never be too sure <laughs> so yeah Man. I encourage all of our listeners you know to kind of just get your feet wet in some way, shape or form in, in some sort of tournament golf. And it's whether it's with the Maryland state golf association or, you know, whatever state you live in, um, you know, get out there, sign up. Yeah. They're, they're, they're awesome tournaments. And, you know, I've had the pleasure of, you know, growing up in Pennsylvania and playing some Pennsylvania state stuff. And then, you know, being down here in Maryland. And, and I think, you know, both Pennsylvania and Maryland state golf, you guys run great events and, it, and they're a pleasure to be a part of, especially, you know, um, from the qualifier and to the am and then you know having the pleasure of playing in the open too they're they're great events and they're well run and, and they're always you know a great a great time to be a part of i appreciate you saying that i'm glad you guys enjoy it like i said I'm so many people that you know they may be apprehensive about playing in their first event and like you say you just need to get your feet wet and try it out you're gonna make some bogeys, but it's okay. <laughs> well, you, you might make a lot of bogeys if if you they set courses up like Fountainhead, because that was a beast. But I loved it. It was fun, man. Uh, and then you know, like I said, it was just uh, it, it's it's fun to be a part of, and and to kind of just you know go back on what you said with you guys celebrating 100 years next year. Um, what what are the big plans, I guess, for you guys as far as celebrating 100 years? Because that that only comes around you know one time to be really celebratory in a in a generation. Yeah, so there's a lot of things that are still being discussed. Um, I can tell you one of the big things we're doing is we're trying to visit all the founding clubs that still exist. Um, So the clubs that originally got together in 1921, signed the charter, the association started. Um, You know, I I can't name them all off the top of my head, but BCC is one of them. Um, I know we talked about going to the Eastern Shore. Talbot Talbot Country Club is one of them. Mm -hmm. It's an event at Talbot. We actually have the 100th Maryland Open at Baltimore Country Club, um, they hosted the first Maryland. So that's even, you know, even cooler from that standpoint. Uh, Rolling Road is one of them. So there's, like I said, there's nine of them. And the ones that the men aren't able to get on the schedule, the women have actually gotten a couple of, um, a couple of the founding clubs on the schedule so that when we roll into 21, we can, we can try to visit each one of those to celebrate. Um, I also think we're, we're trying to get a party, you know, put together some sort of celebration in that regard. Um, and then a couple other things that I was even thinking about earlier today. I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about yet. <laughs> hey, fair enough. Yeah, we don't want to put you in a sticky situation. But yeah, uh, but, I'm, I, but it'll be exciting. I hope you guys will be excited about it too when we're able to announce it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, a hundred years, man, for a golf organization is, is always something to be proud of. And it just speaks to the, the way Maryland state golf association has run things and has kind of always approached things. You know, you don't, uh, you don't see a hundred years by, by not doing things the right way, uh, and giving people a good experience. You know, um, there, there's something to be said about <laughs> sticking around that long. Yeah. I know one other thing we're doing, my, my, uh, my boss, my executive director, he has put together a, uh, a history book on the first hundred years, which is really cool. And it took a lot of hours and a lot of work. Um, but to go back through all the great stories and all the great champions uh, from, from the past hundred years for all of our championships. So we're going to, we're putting that together. Well, we look forward to hopefully seeing that in some way, shape or form. Cause yeah, I mean, it's always fun to look back and man, I mean, you know, the, the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and Dante and I have talked about even a couple of the old books that we have of just golf history in general, um, and it's fascinating to see, you know, how the game has evolved, and I'm sure within just Maryland alone, and, you know, 
members at Baltimore Country Club that look back and say, see maybe some of the images from some of the first, you know, go arounds of the open and, and just to see how it's changed within their own clubs, let alone the state as a whole, will, 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 will truly be something to, to, you know, kind of cherish looking back on. Yeah, it'll be really neat. It'll be really neat. That's awesome. That's very exciting. And, uh, you know, how can people, I guess, find uh, Maryland Stake Golf Association online and, and kind of maybe follow along? I know as kind of things are fluid right now with, with what the schedule is going to look like the rest of this year. Um, how can people, you know, follow along and check in to see when, uh, when our tournaments might be played here in Maryland? So, yeah, so the website is uh, just msga.org. And one of the things that – our staff has worked pretty hard on over the last couple of weeks is, is building a dashboard at the top of the screen. So when you go to msga.org, you'll see a yellow header um, that has all COVID-19 related issues. You know, all the governor executive orders are attached, all the updates on USGA championships and MSGA championships in our schedule um, is attached. We actually made an announcement today. I don't know if you guys saw it, but we had, we had to cancel and po- or postpone and cancel all of our events in May, um, all those qualifiers are um, uh, had to be removed from the schedule because of that. And that, that, that kind of update you'll find on our dashboard on msga.org. Um, and then we're also on social media, which I should have wrote this down before we started. But if you search for us on you know, Instagram and Facebook, you'll find us. Yeah, and we'll we'll tag uh, we'll tag the Instagram along with uh, with our post uh, as well, so you guys can find it there and on the bottom of our uh, of our podcasts as well. Um, Kelly, really appreciate you joining us, man. Um, now, with those cancellations today, I guess, before we let you go, um, are there going to be an expected AM and Open this year? And, and if that, with you said the qualifiers being canceled, are they being rescheduled, or is it just taking last year's field and playing again this year? Or, or how is that being approached? So we're, that's really the top thing we're working on is, um, you know, is how to save the Maryland, or Maryland Open. Um, right now, they're still scheduled on the days that we had them booked. And we're looking at ways to figure out how to get the field set for those, um, which may involve some qualifying, may involve some other things. But I'm hoping that in the next couple of weeks we'll have um, had the plan, you know, in place to be able to share with uh, with our players. For um, sure, working on it, not ready to to announce it just yet, but we're working on it for the last several weeks, and hope to push that out, and hope to kind of roll registration, you know, back open once once these once the golf courses open back up. So. Um, we're just as, as excited as anyone to get to get back out there. Yeah, for sure. No, there's definitely a, you know, we're all kind of holding breath, uh, hoping to see golf back open and uh, hopefully, you know, for you guys to be able to get back on the, uh, the train of just planning things and, and getting that, getting out a kind of revised schedule to everyone. So uh, we can have some tournament golf to look forward to as well. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. Hey, thanks for joining us uh, guys. You guys, you guys can go to msga.org, like he said, to kind of follow along with not only the COVID-19 updates, but uh, just to kind of see how you can join play and even give back to the Maryland state golf association. So um, guys, that is Kelly Newland uh, tournament director from the MSGA. Kelly, thanks so much for the time. Dante Dalton. Thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Look yes, forward sir. to you guys out there this summer. Appreciate All it. Right, we look absolutely. forward to hopefully seeing you in, in some way, shape, or form. All right, guys. Take care. Thank you. All right, guys. As we said, that was Kelly Newland from Maryland State Golf Association. Dante, that was, that was pretty neat to see the insider perspective on, on, you know, my favorite part of the tournament setup. You know, how, how much say these guys truly have and how much thought process really goes into setting up these tournaments, you know, pin positions, tee positions, uh, front tees, back tees, um, you know, and making you think on, on the golf course. Because I think that's a, a lot of what gets overlooked when you go and tee it up at these state events and stuff like that. You know, you don't realize that probably where you're teeing off from and, and where the pins are have has been probably – longer than a few weeks thought process. It's probably been a month's on end process to, to make day one, day two, day three set up completely different from one another and give the guys three different tests throughout the weekend or whatever tournament you're playing. So that was pretty neat to hear from Kelly. Yeah, I enjoyed that. Uh, and it really truly shows the amount of logistics that goes into running a, uh, an event and not only, you know, some of these associations that have you know some big events they have also events from start of the season to the end of season and it's there's an event every weekend so you gotta 
you have to plan well ahead of time the what tournaments you want to run at what dates how you want to schedule it out and on top of that figure out what courses you want to go to and also what courses are saying hey i'm willing to host this tournament yeah we'll we'll be prepared and they probably have other tournaments out there that you know that aren't even part of the that association maybe other associations that are probably reaching out and saying hey we want to host this uh tournament here um what do you guys think you know, i would so almost i would almost say that like the way it sounded from the way he said he, he he's developing these relationships between local club pros and stuff like that that like when the usga sets out every year to have their local qualifiers you always see at least in the ones i've played in and the maryland area um the maryland state golf associations tents are the tents that are up even for the usga locals so it seems like that the usga kind of works hand in hand with the maryland state golf association you know to put on these local qualifiers because it's the it's the state golf association that has the relationships with these clubs with these smaller time you know club pros to to get these events taken care of Mm -hmm. yeah and it seems good uh it goes the same with gap too. you know, golf association of Philadelphia is where my club's affiliated at it. and they're massive because they, they just, uh, I think last year was the first year that they merged with, uh, shoot. I wish I remember, I hope I can remember the name, but it was pretty much all the ones, all the courses up in the Northern Eastern of Pennsylvania. So they merged. So gap kind of basically runs all the way from up the Scranton area out to almost Harrisburg, even down to like Maryland. Um, maybe Maryland, Delaware. Uh, and it's wild to see because there's so many courses that, you know, have the availability or possible availability of running a tournament. And let's not, let's, another thing that kind of like slipped my mind was the fact that even your association and my association, I mean, I got Philly and you got, you know, Maryland and also the DC area. So how many high end old money, prestigious courses there are in these areas that are that are good enough to even just run events for the pga yeah i mean mean, he talked about it a little bit and like i guess i never really um thought of this to to the fullest degree when asking you know what made the decision of where they have their golf courses and it was kind of interesting to hear because you know they're like he said they're running into their 100th year anniversary next year um, and Baltimore Country Club, which has obviously been a staple in Maryland golf since the inception of the State Golf Association, um, hosted the first ever uh, open championship for Maryland. And it, it's incredible to see because, like, I mean, you look at the clubs, like you said, that are in and around the D.C. Baltimore metro area. You got Congressional. You have the Baltimore Country Club. You have TPC um, – TPC – Avenel TPC Avenel Farms. We're gonna edit that out. <laughs> TPC Avenel Farms, um, and you know that have held professional tournaments on the PGA, the U.S. Open. I mean, you you forget in that corridor how much great golf there is, um, and it, it's because I think that it's not. You know, Maryland is never, unless the U.S. Open is coming to Congressional, on your top uh, kind of conversation list of uh of golf in the country um and i think i feel like the only time philadelphia really gets talked about is when things come to marion you know other marion, than that and uh, then aronimic had the bmw uh two years ago oh and that's um, right um Aronimic seeing the fedex cup come back i believe to they're seeing the the playoff come back to the philadelphia area i believe possibly i know i know for a fact playoff golf is coming back to baltimore um in the coming years i believe in 2021 playoff golf is coming to maryland yeah so actually so funny enough you know you just mentioned aronimic um coming the pga coming to aronimic because of the bmw the bmw in 2021 is actually shifting to baltimore um the fedex cup is going to be played at caves valley now you want to talk about a course that no one's really heard of on a national scale until this point it's caves valley it's a Hmm. gem never heard of it just north of baltimore um it is most likely i think one of the top 10 most challenging courses in the state um it's a it's a great great layout a great design 
Um, it's only been open since like the mid nineties. So um, it's fairly newer club. Um, it's hosted the U S senior open. So, I mean, it, it's had some, some prestigious national events there in the past, but uh, yeah, the, the PGA tour is bringing the FedEx cup to it. So uh, that should be exciting to see more in our neck of the woods in the better Baltimore metropolitan area. Yeah. It's uh it's cool to see. Um, cause you know, like, Cause you got to think about it now that the PGA man there, I mean, Philly's so, you know, on top of each other and there's not much room. And with these events, they're looking for venues that can host parking uh, and, and bring in a bunch of people because they're trying to bring in revenue and they're trying to make ticket sales and they're trying to give people an experience. So you're going to need a lot of land to basically not only fill the field with players, but also fill uh, have space to fill the fans where they're not really so they have so they have places to go walk around and be behind the ropes and the parking's huge. I mean, when I went to the BMW uh, a couple of years ago, I mean we parked almost 35, 45 minutes away and had to take like a shuttle bus or called an Uber just so we can get onto the onto the property because that area was also blocked off for all of the players to come in. And, you know, so they got places to stay in the area or where they can park because not only are they, you know, you got the players that they have to logistically like move around, but you mm-hmm. know, they're kind of altering that course a little bit because you're throwing up grandstands and stuff. So you got to find different ways to allow the play, uh, patrons or anybody to come in. So there's so much more logistics that go on behind the scenes for just your, especially on the PGA for your, uh, for your viewership as, as a fan. So, you know, um, like I mean, it yeah, surprise people, me people who don't, uh, don't truly understand the logistics. Uh, we keep bringing this word up today, but it's true. When you talk tournament, uh, tournament golf, there's so many ways, to, you know, that things can go wrong because there's so much that goes into it especially from a tour side of things where you're bringing fans into the equation in, you know, in the thousands, you know, in, you know, 30, 40, 50,000, and especially at FedEx cup events, I think you're talking closer to a hundred thousand. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's so logistically uh, tough to make those events happen. And, yeah, uh, and it's got, it's gotta be tough too for the, for the, even on like the state end of things and they want to host tournaments too, because most of these places are going to be played at some pretty, pretty nice courses or they're private, semi-private, private courses. So you're going to have members and the course itself is doing stuff on their end throughout. They have their own tournament list for their members. So now you got to kind of go back and forth of what you can fit in because, you know, it's not just some like high end crazy course like Augusta where, you know, they, they have the opportunity where like, Hey, we're going to shut the course down for X amount of months just so we can prepare for the masters. And the members are like, okay, that's fine. I mean, you got courses with hard working Americans that are members there that are paying for their experience to play. So you're basically saying, Hey, this weekend shut off for well, you guys. And, and not play. only the, the tough part, you know, having experienced it myself of like going to these courses in, in Maryland during the open that they host there, it's not just three or four days for the open. It's a day or two in advance when all these players are flocking to get their practice rounds in, Mm -hmm. you know, Maryland state golf association uh, runs that as well. So it's like, um, it's, it's crazy to, to see these kind of blue collar, like you said, blue collar country clubs shut down for four straight days. I mean, I know for a fact, members don't like it. Um, It's cool to see these top players in the state descend on their course and see how they play. But at the same time, it's like, you know, in, in one way or shape or form, you can kind of say, well, what's one weekend, you know, give up one weekend to watch these players come in and, you know, play championship golf at your course. But on the other end, it's like, well, I mean, in, in what usually is like Maryland and, you know, Pennsylvania and Jersey and Delaware, what is usually only like a five month, six month season anyway, before it gets really cold. I'm giving up one weekend, usually in the prime of June or July, you know, that's, that's, that's prime golf weather. And to give up usually weekdays plus a weekend, it, it does stink. And I, and I see why some members aren't the biggest fans of, of these events coming through. Yeah. And there's like a pride of, I guess, ownership in a membership 
to some of these guys. They like they want to go and play their course that mm-hmm. they belong to. You know, you walk in and you walk on that, you know, that complex, and you you walk in the pro shop. You like you're, it's like, hey, how you doing? How's how's everything? How's the, how's the family? How's the kids? How's the wife? You know, yeah, it's like yeah. it's that first name basis. It's not when you go to like some public tracks and you just you're just a number. And they're just swiping your credit card and you're on out there. There, There's more to it when you, when you have that pride and belonging to a course and saying, you know, I want to go play the course that I pay for on a yearly basis. And that I am a member at because, you know, it's my second home. Yeah. A hundred percent. I've had plenty of uh, plenty of time in um you know down here on the eastern shore at uh now working on my second club that i'm a member at um and there is like you said there's just that some people that have been at these clubs for their entire life that take so much pride in in, you know it being their family you know and and not just like you said walking onto your local muni and and i think even at local munis they some some guys you know are, are muni guys for their entire yeah, life. Have, and you and, have the muni regulars that are like, this yeah. is my place. So These I are my stopping it, grounds. I think you have it everywhere. Um, but I, I think it's on a little bit more of a, uh, you know, first name basis at, uh, at some of these paid clubs for guys that have been there for a very long time. But uh, yeah, it was super cool <laughs> to see, um, you know, kind of his thought process through all the Maryland state stuff and, and how they pick courses and how he, you know, goes through the process of just, having events, um, you know, find precedence, whether it's the AM, the open, the father, son, the better ball. Um, and you know, it was really exciting to see that he was already in talks with, you know, the board of directors to, to hopefully have a mid handicap, high handicap, uh, style event in the future. That was, that was pretty sweet to see as well. I was a, I was a big fan of that. Cause I do have, um, I do have friends of mine that are in, in that wheelhouse of, you know, that they're on that, like that five to seven range. And then you got guys in between that, like seven and 12 and they, they can play, you know, they, right. They, it's just, it's just, they have those one bad holes that keeps you, keeps them from really dropping their, you know, their handicap because and let's face it, you gotta be pretty consistent when you want to get down to those ones and twos and even threes and even plus handicap. So, and, and I know that there some of them are probably a little bit timid and, and possibly maybe afraid of, you know, getting their, getting their feet wet and trying to play that, you know, competitive round or that one step into that tournament where they probably in the back of their mind feel as if they don't belong. And it, it's good to see that what we were talking about is they're interested in doing those type of mid handicap tournaments, just so you can get, get to get more people into it so they can realize how much fun it is to really go, go out there and, you know, where make sure everything counts and really grind it out. I feel like once guys jump that gap too, and they finally start competing in these mid am events or mid, not mid am mid level events. Um, it, it'll inspire them to, to get better. And, and you'll start to see a lot of these guys roll over from, you know, eight to 12 handicaps into that single digit handicap space. And, and I, I think it, it almost, uh, you know, is like job security in, in a way for any state organization. It's like, you know, once these guys get a taste of good quality tournament golf, they're going to strive for, to play more, to practice more. And, and all of a sudden you have more people in your main events, your main AMs, your main opens, because your double digit handicappers all of a sudden turn into your single digit handicappers. And then you got some good players, you know, kind of feeding through. So um, I, I think I the, the best thing we can go for the game is to start including more people into these tournament golf atmospheres. I think so too. And then like you were saying, I mean, it's almost an untapped market in a way. If you look on an individual standpoint, mm-hmm. like if you're looking at your own point, like say you're saying a nine in between a nine and a 10 and you've been bouncing back and forth. Right. And you just can't, can't seem to break it and you're doing everything possible. And then, you know, you go, you, Hey, let me, let me put a little bit more pressure on myself. Let's get that focus. Let me sign up for a tournament, but I don't want to sign up for a tournament where I got to play against a bunch of ones and twos where I'm right. just, Oh, yeah. You know, because a, a lot of, I mean, let's face it, these tournaments are expensive. You're throwing up some money. You're, you're throwing up some money um, to 
to go go to these tournaments because you're going to some higher end courses you're going to see some tournament conditions so these courses are you know putting a little bit more pressure onto their supers to get these courses a little bit Mm -hmm. on a tournament ready so you know there's more strain uh more pressure on that um you're also got to pay for the the course um so you can pay for one not only year round but also the tournament fees so all this money that needs to go into it in order to set everything up you you're, you're paying into that so i don't want to go to a tournament knowing well that i'm, I'm going to be playing like plus handicaps and i'm dropping like a buck 60 on a tournament and you know i'm just going to be like well what did i waste it'd be right. nice to go play in a tournament where okay these guys are a little bit more yeah. my level where like I'm a little bit more comfortable paying that X amount of dollars and knowing I'm going to actually benefit coming out of it, whether I win or lose, you know, you have a bet, you know, in the back of your mind, you have a chance of actually competing and being up in the top Uh because you're playing within your wheelhouse. But at the same time, you know, you're going to, you're going to get better because now you're putting a lot more pressure on yourself. It's like, all right, how, okay, cool. That's a good test. It's a good test for myself and see, all right, well, what did I, what do I really need to work on? And then you can go back on that. And then it's, it's, and then you'll just watch, you'll just watch, you know, watch it happen. Uh, you can probably see so much more potential in your game and see it's, how much better you can get within that, that year. Just, just competing. I mean, it always, it, I always just feel like the, the, anytime you can get yourself in front of better competition, whether it's, similar handicappers like yourself if you're a 10 handicap going out with even someone who's not a 10 but an eight you know someone who's just a little bit better than you that might have a slight edge on you it forces you to focus more forces you to play better you know um i just think all around um anytime you can get in a tournament atmosphere like that is awesome and like you said it's just going to make you better at the end of the day i mean i did it myself last year i I finally said you know what my handicap's low enough i'm i'm eligible for the mid-amp that we had, I luckily it was one of the qualifiers was at a uh, was at Elmhurst, so I drove up, uh, stayed um, with our buddy Paul in the stand. Um, shout out to those guys. Hope they are uh, doing fine during the during the quarantine. But made kind of a trip out of it. Uh, was you know made it a little bit longer because it was during the week. Um, kind of took a couple of days off, so I was also I spent the weekend with them too. But I played in it and. You know, it was it was a good test. It was a good test to see where I was at. It was a good test on how how do I mentally handle myself <laughs> and against the competition. And I mean, it was tough. And I was kind of right in there. I mean, I came three over off the front, and I said, "Oh." And the one guy said, "Keep pushing." I mean, he goes, "You're right in it," because uh, I think like seventy five, seventy six kind of made the cut to get into the championship. Mm-hmm. And I was sitting there. I was like, "All right, cool, cool." And then next thing I do. I topped my tee shot on the 10th, 10th hole, par five. No, 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 no. It was the 11th hole. I bogey the 10th, came on the 11th and like topped my tee shot. And I was just like, Oh my God. But it was a learning experience. I mean, the nerves will get to you. So, it, but, so I played in other competitions later down in the year. It was more of a team event thing, but I was more ready. I was a lot more ready for it. And it, it, and it shows. So, I mean, just that one tournament alone in golf uh, it was and in life, in golf and in life, you can only learn, I think, by repetition of, of just learning how to do things, you know, and, and the more you put yourself in that atmosphere, um, the, the only, the better you're going to get, I feel like. So, um, you know, one thing, I, one thing else I wanted to touch on, it was, it was almost a bummer to kind of hear that, you know, a state golf association um, doesn't have as much say on if the golf course is going to open yet or not, you know, uh, you in New Jersey, me in in Maryland here, we talk about it constantly of just like, you know, when are we going to know if we can play golf again? When are we going to hear about it? And it seems like, you know, it hasn't even been mentioned yet in either of our states at a, at a government level, while states like California, states like New York um, are are opening back up. Two hotbeds. Yeah. um, Two, two places in this country where um, it seems like things were going to be shut down for, a very long time, you know, with California having LA and San Francisco that went on complete lockdown. um, You're even seeing those counties open back golf courses. So um, it was a little bit of a bummer to see that, you know, we've, we had some fans on, uh, on Instagram kind of reaching out to us and saying uh, we opened up the questions to them to see what they would ask. And that was one of their main questions was, you know, as a state run golf or association, 
it's been around for so long, how much say do they have in opening back the golf courses? Are they in talks with, you know, our legislation? And it seems like, uh, unfortunately, that's not the case. It seems like they don't really have a say and aren't being asked to have a say, you know, um, you look at, you look at states like, unfortunately, like Pennsylvania, um, and, and their governor straight out said that, you know, well, you can't golf uh, be, because it's, it's two people in a cart. And, you know, it just seems like there's a, a disassociation between what golf truly is and, and we need, people uh, having the legislation, like that are making our, the calls. We need these governors just, we need the, we need to put governors in office that love golf because <laughs> they'd be open. They yeah. would be open and immediately because they're probably thinking, man, I am bored as shit right now <laughs> and I want to get it outside. And I, I get it. I get it. We want to stay away from people. But what's better with doing an act, act and yeah. in other people that's driving people nuts is the fact that you're stuck inside and they, we're human beings. We're meant to be outdoors. We're about to be getting our hands dirty and, and, and move around. Like being confined in a room all day is, is tough and it will get to some people mentally, but what's no better way to get out there and be social, dis, be completely social distant walking on a golf course. I mean, it, it, it blows my mind. And, you know, all, all I think we can really say about it is it's unfortunate that those that are making the decisions don't truly understand a lot that is, you know, encompasses the game of golf, because I think as golf fans and everyone in inside the industry, gets it they understand that like hey golf is one of the things that man we can so easily socially distance and have ourselves um out there day in and day out and and not create an issue to spread this thing and i yeah and i know like we're obviously biased we love it we're highly highly biased (laughs) highly biased and and even trying to think like on the other side of things like well you know like well this this is closed i can't do this because you know i say i like to play basketball and not and that's like confined court and it's five on five and you're bumping into each other and you know you're sweating and all this so you're like contacting the virus you can contact the virus between like people can be like well that's but like what's i just don't i just don't understand why we can't find like a regular regulation to the stuff that's like kind of outdoors that are socially distance acceptable for everybody because let's face it like ooh, a lot of people just want to get outside. <laughs> it's like, can we just go outside? Can I go outside and play, please? I mean, that's the thing, though, dude. You can. You're allowed to go outside, yeah. run around, play around. Yeah. But I want to go outside and, and play with a I'll... white ball and some and 14 clubs. You know? Uh, I know. That's all. It's just been very windy lately. It's been driving me nuts. It's either sunny and windy, which makes it cold, or it's warm and rainy. I we just can't catch a break. We just can't catch a break. In, and someone, the, for the love of God, the make, the, make the weather nice because Dante's about to have a breakdown. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to lose my shit in a moment. Oh, man. Well, can't. guys, that's, uh, that's <laughs> it from us this week. We hope you enjoyed the show. Um, you know, it, we've been pretty blessed so far to have the guests we have had on. And uh, I want to thank you guys because it all boils down to the guys, who are, guys and girls who are out there listening. Um, and recommending us to more people each and every week. So thank you guys, um, you know, and we really appreciate everything that you guys have done for us so far. Um, If you guys want to rep our brand, if you want to rep the Enjoy the Walk logo, um, you know, go to our website, www.enjoythewalkpod.com. We have all of our t-shirts up there, the Game of Golf, the Life-inspired t-shirts. We have some funny little quips, you know, on t-shirts as well on there that you guys can pick up and support our brand. Um, And if you guys haven't checked out our YouTube page yet, we're kind of, you know, jumping slowly but surely into the unboxing and review side of the game as well, um, which has been pretty neat for us. We've been able to see some really cool products, hopefully more here on the the coming up. But uh, we did a recent unboxing which will have the ceo and founder of squares golf shoes on the show uh in the coming weeks but uh go out and check out check out our youtube page as well same thing enjoy the walk podcast on youtube uh we have all of our podcasts on there in video form so you guys can watch those in quarantine but we also have some you know product reviews on there as well so check that out on youtube check out our website and guys if you could always just leave us a rating and review and just share our podcast with one other person today it would mean the world so thank you guys seriously we hope to be on the golf course sooner rather than later Um, and if you are out there golfing just remember carry your clubs one foot in front of the other enjoy life and enjoy the walk Stop. One
Shannon.